one. What do you say, everybody? And welcome to our Bama Factor, Alabama Players in the NFL podcast. I'm Mick Gillespie with Bama Insider, and it's great to have J.P. Shadrick, both of us Alabama alumnists, and J.P. with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Uh, first off, thanks for joining us, and uh, what do you guys got going on with the Jags? Great to be back with you, Mick. It is week 11 in the NFL. The Jags are 1-8. and eight. They've dropped eight in a row after a win in week one, including last week in Green Bay, where they played pretty well against the Packers. They had a special teams touchdown. Uh, the defense uh, won the turnover battle 2-1, to one, and they still lost, so they couldn't finish it off in the fourth quarter. Aaron Rodgers had a late touchdown to put the Packers ahead for good, and, and obviously they're, they're good for a reason. It was a, a nasty weather day, windy and all that up there at Lambeau. Just didn't go well. The last couple of weeks, though, they played hard. They've been close. They just haven't quite got over the hump yet, and it doesn't get uh, easier for the Jags because the Pittsburgh Steelers come to town this week, the last undefeated team in football. Yeah, right now the Trevor Lawrence sweepstakes has the Jets without a win and then the Jaguars second. And in the NFL, you get a franchise quarterback like Trevor Lawrence and it really can change the fortunes of a team. There's no doubt about that. And that's what the Jaguars have really been missing. You can go all the way back to Mark Brunel. He was traded into the organization in the mid-90s, right when the team started. So he wasn't drafted by the Jaguars. The Jags have only drafted three first-round quarterbacks all time, and this is their 26th year of football this season. Byron Leftwich was one of those. Mm -hmm. Blaine Gabbert didn't work out. Neither one of those guys did. And Blake Bortles. And they doubled down on Bortles and paid him again, and he didn't work out then either. So, uh, yeah, they're due. They haven't really put a lot of draft equity into the quarterback position in the first round. And it's um, a big reason why. You, you just got to roll the dice. You got to go get your guy. And you have to be – a lot of times it's the, the odds are better that if it's a first-round quarterback, uh, it's going to work out a lot better than a, a later-round draft pick. I remember Byron Leftwich at Marshall saw them yep. play – East Carolina and uh, whatever the Mobile Bowl is, and, and it was the most incredible comeback ever. He's an offensive coordinator now. Sure. All right, well, let's talk about some of the guys that played at Alabama that made an impact in the NFL, particularly this week. Sunday Night Football saw the Patriots as a home underdog for the first time in a long time. Now, this is a team without Tom Brady, and they've been struggling this year. And the Baltimore Ravens came into town. Last year, Baltimore thumped New England when they had Tom Brady. But uh, this Sunday night, it was the Patriots that won in a deluge, in a pouring rain that saw Damian Harris, who was Alabama's running back a year ago, uh, just have a spectacular game. There were a ton of Alabama players in this game besides Harris. The Ravens, the Bozeman and Fluker are, are offensive linemen. You got uh, Marlon Humphrey in the secondary, of course, uh, running back for former Heisman Trophy winner Mark Ingram's on that team. And it was Damian Harris that kind of stole the show uh, with, you know, over 100 yards rushing and led the Patriots to a big win. Yeah, a big ball game for him. 22 carries, 121 yards in that game. And on the season so far, he's carrying the ball at a five and a half yard per carry clip. That's fantastic. Of course, 85 rushes this year, just under 500 yards. And in limited action. He didn't play in September. His first game out there was October 5th. Uh, he had a hand injury early in the season. So he's come on strong, and that's a good sign. And it was interesting reading about uh, some of his comments after the game about playing with all these Alabama guys and, and getting to the league is important, obviously, when you're coming from Alabama. But staying in the league and performing well when you get to that level is important also, certainly. And to have that many guys – in one place at one time. I know they're all over the league, but that's a lot of guys in uh, in one football game from one school. Yeah, he was talking about how fortunate it was for him and then everyone else to get to that level. I love this part of the comment. He, he talked about uh, just seeing all those guys out there and being able to compete with those guys that I played with at such a high level in college, obviously at Alabama, and won national championships and SEC championships with. I mean, I think that helps recruiting if you're Nick Saban. Yeah. You know, that's what it's all about. These guys go to college. They eventually want to get to the league. And then you don't see them in the NFL talk a lot about college. I mean, normally it's like, hey, that's, that was then and this is now. But there's a lot of pride for those former Alabama players and their time spent at the capstone. You know what helps pride, Mick? 
jewelry helps pride. When you have <laughs> rings and you can flash those babies in the locker room, well, uh, you, you have some bragging rights, let's say. So uh, I think that's why the Alabama guys, especially a lot more are a little more vocal about it than some others. But hey, that's part of the deal when, when there's been success at the college level. Um, that doesn't really go away quickly out of your mind. That sticks with you forever, really. And, and then you go into the NFL, and if you can perform well and continue to improve and get better as the years go on, you can have jewelry of your own from the league as well, hopefully at some point down the line. Yeah, no doubt about it. And he was one of four former Alabama players – to have a big week in the NFL and run for over 100 yards. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more, but you know, look at the graphic there. Uh, four guys running for 100 yards, but it was Damian Harris and his 22 carries and 121 yards that led the way. That's a pretty good company, though, when you talk about Derrick Henry and Kenyon Drake you know, and uh, Damian Harris and you know, uh, Josh Jacobs. So a lot of fun seeing former Alabama players with success on the ground, something that we see in Tuscaloosa. Right, and we've seen it for about a decade, you know, 10, 12 years in Tuscaloosa now, right? I mean, those guys, they roll in a set of running backs, and you're thinking, oh, gosh, they got to split the carries in Tuscaloosa. There's two or three guys. How's this guy going to play? I mean, Josh Jacobs didn't play, for goodness sake, at Alabama, right? He comes up, and all of a sudden he's making huge plays in the NFL. Um, and it's worked. So they, they roll through those guys in Tuscaloosa, bring on the next guy as a younger player, and the, the older guy moves on, and it just the, the system continues. Running back you, man, I think it's really turned into that in Tuscaloosa. Great to have you guys with us, whether you're watching on YouTube right now. Give us a thumbs up. Also, subscribe to the channel. JP and I are going to try to get together once a week and recap what happened in the NFL with former Bama players. Also, if you downloaded our podcast through Apple and Spotify, uh, give us a five-star ranking, you know, and also subscribe to the channel there as well. But it's great to have you with us tonight as we talk about NFL and Alabama football, kind of uh, rolled up into one big bubble. All right, the guy that we're paying close attention to is Tua. I mean, we all love Tua. I mean, it's hard not to. I, I think even he's kind of a, a Tim Tebow type of personality, infectious, uh, seems to be the type of person that you would just like to be around, whether it was on the football field or just out at dinner somewhere. It's just a big smile on his face. They moved him in, the Dolphins did, to the, the, the starting lineup. And all he's done is go 3-0 and so far. And all of a sudden now, the Dolphins have become maybe one of the NFL's best teams. It's amazing, right? I mean, they were good anyway. And then they put two in there, and they haven't lost since then. That was the big concern. Oh, Brian Fitzpatrick's playing well. He's the veteran. The team likes the guy. I know two, two is the future. But why would you mess up a good thing by shaking up the quarterback position now? Well, you know, it feels like they 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 knew what they were doing. Now he's not putting up 300 yard games and five touchdowns and all that stuff yet, but he is efficient as can be. 104.8 rating through three games so far. That he's protecting the football. Five touchdowns, no interceptions so far, and wins football games. Now they have defensive help and they're getting some special teams play that's very good to go with that. So it's complementary team football, but a big piece of that is Tua protecting the ball on the offensive side, managing this offense, and he's off to a fantastic start. And you look at his numbers there, 15 to 25, 169 yards. I think the big number, though, besides the two touchdowns, is the zero interceptions. And you got into that. You said, hey, you know, he's protecting the football. The funny part of this is we know how explosive Tua is. But right now, it's like, hey, we don't want you to be explosive. We just want you to play within our system, give our defense a chance to win. This is so different than what he did in Tuscaloosa. It's just an entirely different strategy. It almost reminds me of what Alabama did with young A.J. McCarron before he kind of developed into a passing quarterback and eventually uh, moved on to the NFL himself. That's a lot to ask. I mean, for a guy to, to throw it all over the yard all game long up in the NFL. It's, the guys are too good to do that all the time. So I think this is a pretty good approach. Obviously, it's working out in the win-loss column, but um, for a young guy to gain some confidence, he may not need a lot. He already has a lot to begin with because he's Tua, but 
uh, give him some confidence in his first few starts, get some things going on offense, and you know, then you can build upon that when the time is right. Uh, the time now is for them to stay in the division race and get to the playoffs for the first time in forever and then maybe make a little bit of a run, and it feels like they've got something going in Miami. Yeah, what's it going to take for Tua to get these guys in, into the playoffs? you think it's more of the same, or do you think eventually – uh, they expect for him to throw the football more. Well, they'll throw it around. I think this is a pretty good pace for them right now, right? Let's look at their schedule ahead as well while we're looking at it. I'm going to look at it on the podcast here live. Let's go down. Coming up, the Dolphins have the Broncos in Denver coming up. They haven't played well this year. They're at the Jets after that. That could be a winning result. And then they get the Bengals in the great matchup uh, between uh, him and Joe Burrow. So, those are some fun football games if you're a Dolphins fan. If they just keep going like they're going, I think they're in a really good shape now all of a sudden. After an 0-2 start and a 1-3 or a one and three start, uh, they reeled off five in a row now. Could be six, seven, eight in a row. And uh, then all of a sudden you're, you're counting down games at the end of the year and the magic numbers start going in. But Buffalo uh, leads away in that division, though. They're seven and three. I'm not sure – if you'll be able to walk them down. It's possible, though, the way they're playing in Miami. Yeah, it'd be interesting because it's been the defense, really. I mean, when you look at that Dolphins team, yep. it, it's been their ability to, uh, to you know, keep the opponents from scoring. They've been putting a lot of pressure on the quarterback. And this is a team that traded away some of its best players, including the guy we're going to get into next, Kenyon Drake, uh, to build what they've built. And, I mean, it's phenomenal that they're good so fast. It is. It really is. But it's part of the plan, right? I don't know if they planned it to be this quickly, but the plan was, you know, tear it all the way down, get the new head coach in there, the new system in, everything going, give him a five-year deal, let it be set, then get the franchise quarterback, and maybe in a couple of years after. Well, I think they're ahead of schedule, Mick. Let's say that. Um, I think it's going to be good for a long time down there if they can keep everybody healthy and involved and at the pace they are right now. It's a good start. Long way to go. Well, we talked about Kenyon Drake because, you know, in uh, our first segment, really, we were talking about Damian Harris being one of four running backs who in the NFL this week ran for over 100 yards. Kenyon Drake and the Cardinals, how about that win that they had on the Kyler Murray Hail Mary. Uh, it was just unbelievable. I can remember being a kid in the backyard and wanting to catch a pass like that. Um, watching uh, Hopkins jump up in the middle of three guys and catch the ball with no time on the clock. Uh, but it was Kenyon Drake's running game that, that helped keep the Cardinals in that contest to beat Buffalo. Yeah, it's too bad you can't jump, though, Mick. That's, that's when it became reality for you that you can't go up and get that football. No. But uh, it is pretty incredible to see what Kyler Murray's doing, first of all, with his ability to run and the athleticism he plays with. And on that ball, running to his left, throwing with his right hand. I and mean, that's hard to do to get it anywhere close to on target and certainly was on target. But, hey, it's a two-headed monster in a running game. You got uh, the quarterback running around, Murray, who's right behind him in league rankings and rushing yards. And then Kenyon Drake, who's seventh in rush yards, 612 for the season in the NFL this year and eighth in the league in attempts. So they give him the ball a lot. Uh, with Murray kind of pacing this offense, it opens things up a little bit more in the running game for Kenyon Drake. It feels like 1,200 rushing yards between these two guys. Think about that, the quarterback and the running back. So um, I'm curious to see if they can continue this pace as well. Uh, that is a tough division in the NFC West. Uh, three teams at six and three at the top, Arizona, the L.A. Rams, and Seattle. But, boy, these guys have been really fun to watch this year on offense. Yeah, and, you know, for Kenyon Drake, I mean, you talk about going back to Arizona to play. Remember, it was it was him that scored as a kick returner in that national championship game that was played in Phoenix against Clemson. And who would have known that that would have been the first of three epic battles for the title and four times that the two that the two clubs have met in the college football playoff. But I can I mean I can see it. I mean I've got a statue behind me. I don't right there of Kenyon Drake, you know, hitting the you know the pylon in that that thriller. It's funny. I, uh, I how do you remember what game was where? There's so many of them it feels like that I, I couldn't tell you 
what stadium that game was in. That's a pretty good pull by you, Nick. I must well, say. I was there. I, I was sitting <laughs> next to, to Mike Johnson, uh, former Alabama offensive lineman. So every time Alabama would score, you know, he would get excited and those giant hands would, would, would slap me on the back. So – I had a, a very good memory of that, uh, physically and mentally. But it was it was fun. One of the best games I ever went to, and um, you know, Kenyon Drake has been even better and being even more explosive in the NFL than he had been in college. Right, and er, in his earlier days in Miami, they used him down there in the passing game a lot. I, he had a year, um, a few years back now, that it was like 450 receiving yards. Well, they're not doing any of that with him this year in Arizona. He, he just he only has just a few catches, if if that. So it's all run game now for Drake, and he is explosive as all heck, and he fits right into that offensive attack in Arizona. No doubt about it. All right, let's go over to the defense for a second. Ronnie Harrison with the Browns. Cleveland's one of those teams where you better keep an eye on them. They all of a sudden now find themselves uh, you know, tied with Baltimore, everyone chasing the Pittsburgh Steelers. The Steelers haven't lost a game yet, but – uh, it's been that defense. Mac Wilson's on that team from Alabama as well. I guess if you want to win in the NFL, you got to go out there and get those Bama defenders. Yeah, well, I, <laughs> we'll tap the brakes a little bit. There are other good defenders out there as well. I know it's an Alabama podcast, but um, yes, it, it does help. There are a lot of good defensive players, of course, and a lot of d- good defensive linemen over the last few years, especially that come out of the of uh, Tuscaloosa defensive backs yes they're all over the league as well the, the Jags get to see Mika Fitzpatrick this week the safety for the Steelers also but Ronnie is right in that conversation he was with the Jaguars remember and the Jags traded him over to the Browns for a 2021 fifth round pick um, during training camp this year and it just it seemed like it was time for a, a split a change it was a different type of mentality happening here in Jacksonville basically trying to just get things back down a clean slate on the defensive side of the backfield there. So they sent him on to Cleveland, where obviously they feel like they have a shot this year to do something. And he had a pick six against Indy back in week five this year. But since then, he's been active on defense the last three games. He's had nine tackles, 10 tackles, and six tackles, and a pass defense in each of those games. So we know how hard he hits. We know how well he plays closer to the line of scrimmage in physical situations. That's really his game. And he's fit right in that defense in Cleveland. He's J.P. Shadrick from the Jacksonville Jaguars. I'm Mick Gillespie. Bama Insider, whether you're watching on YouTube, give us a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel. We really appreciate you guys being here with us tonight um, as we talk Alabama players in the NFL. And uh, also for those of you that have downloaded the podcast through Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts, hey, it's great to talk Alabama in the NFL with you uh right now and we'll, we'll try to do this each week all right so we, we talk about about harrison and and this browns team and another guy that you really have kind of spotlighted is cam sims uh, you know maybe one of those alabama players that didn't get a lot of recognition but all of a sudden playing for the washington football team uh you know starting to see the ball a little bit He is, and you got to remember this division is gettable for anybody. Philly leads the way at three, five, and one. The Giants at three and seven. Washington and Dallas two and seven, and we're not quite to Thanksgiving yet, so anything could happen. But this is an interesting story with Sim. Dontrell Inman has been out with a hamstring injury for Washington, um, and did not practice again Wednesday for the football team. So this is an opportunity for Cam Sims to stay on the field. He's really stepped in in his place while he's been absent to play well. Uh, Last week against the Lions, he was on the field 94% of the snaps. He really didn't leave the field at all on offense. Five targets, four catches, 54 yards in that game. And then the week before that against the Giants, four targets, three receptions, 110 yards, his first 100-yard game. Um, You know, other guys are going on and off the field on offense in certain situations at wide receiver for Washington. But Alex Smith is uh, leaning on him more and more. I know those aren't big, flashy numbers, but he's out there. He's reliable, and it's a good little run for him right now. And we'll see how long Inman's out and if, you know, if Ron Rivera decides to make a change or not. Because if he keeps playing like this, he might not leave the field. Yeah, and you talk about uh, receivers 
in the NFL. I mean, compare it to the four running backs that had 100 yards. Alabama has a ton of alumni receivers, you know, Julio Jones. I mean, you can go down the, you know, Calvin Ridley. You know, it's like it, it's a who's who, Amari Cooper out there. We don't talk a lot about, about Cam Sims. You know, Ruggs is in the NFL now, and, he, you know, he'll have some big games. Uh, but it is good to see, like, even some of those guys that, that weren't necessarily superstars for Alabama and Nick Saban make an impact. Well, that's how it goes sometimes. You know, you you may – like we just talked about with Jacobs earlier, right? It happened that he was a high draft pick when he didn't play a lot. Well, you can still have a role in the NFL – with limited tape in college if you're good enough and you're good enough on teams and and then all of a sudden you go out and make some plays on the offensive side of the ball you can stick around he was an undrafted player back in 2018 and you know hasn't had a lot statistically going on the first couple years of his career but this is really could be his opportunity to break out and make a name for himself and stick around the nfl for as long as he can. It's these moments right here, these weeks. They may not be on Sunday night football or on Monday night on a national audience, but it's weeks like he's having, the last two. If he can string those together, stay on the field, Washington needs him, we're going to keep you around, and uh, here we go. That's how a career gets born, and you know it may not be a, a direct path to a 10, 15-year NFL career, but not many careers are like that. So good for Cam to, to stick with it, and let's hope he continues to play well. Yeah, and you start to get notoriety in the NFL when you become a star on people's fantasy rosters. <laughs> right. Well, it's true. That's a big. That's changed a lot these days, right? Nobody's heard of you until you you score two touchdowns, and all of a sudden you're uh, one of the most picked up players that week in fantasy. So uh, that has changed the mentality of folks who kind of follow the league for sure. Well, the Browns, we talked about them with uh, some defenders that played at Alabama. They are taking on the Eagles 12 noon Central time on Sunday. Uh, any other games that stick out in your mind? I know you got some Bama players in that Titans-Ravens matchup. That's I'd another say. noon game. Yeah, you got Derek <laughs> Two Henry. Two trophy winners. Right, against, uh, against Mark Ingram. I mean, that would be one of those, you know, those uh, – uh, memorabilia shot pictures. You get both of them there. You, you get them to sign it. It'd be pretty cool to have Alabama's two Heisman Trophy winners in the same place at the same time. Any other game those stick out to you? Let's see here. The uh, Like we said this week, I'll be watching. I'll be at the Steelers-Jaguars game, making Fitzpatrick with a handful of interceptions on the back end this year. They've got a really good defense, obviously, in, in Pittsburgh this year, and the front seven especially. Uh, that'll be a good one to watch. We'll see what Tua does a mile high in Denver this week. Maybe they'll open up a little bit there. And uh, we mentioned the football team, Washington. They're hosting the Bengals. Uh, let's see if Cam Sims can continue that success, um, you know, in getting later into the season and, and keep that going. Uh, those are the big ones that stick out to me, Mick. I mean, this is, um, you know, it's, we're just past the halfway point of the NFL season, so – all of a sudden, Thanksgiving is next week, and then it's the stretch run in the league. Yep, don't forget Sunday Night Football. Chiefs and Raiders used to be a big-time rivalry. Josh Jacobs, Henry Ruggs will be in that game. Two former Alabama players that are starring now in the league. Well, JP, any final thoughts before we bid everyone farewell for the week? Well, it's good to have uh, Alabama football back this week after a little bit of a hiatus, unfortunately, but uh, get back on the field hopefully this week and, and continue the season and continue to play well. And, and certainly for uh, us in Jacksonville as well, the uh, the season has been on schedule so far. We've been fortunate with that. Let's just keep it going and keep everybody healthy. All right, he's J.P. Shadrick. I'm Mick Gillespie. Again, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thanks for downloading. Bama Factor, NFL, Alabama players doing their thing. Apple. Spotify, you can always download the podcast or anything that Bama Insider puts out. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, give us the thumbs up on there. We appreciate you being here tonight. Subscribe to the channel. I'm Mick Gillespie again for J.P. Chadwick. Thanks for watching, guys. Roll Tide.